Um, where was I? Fish. So, it's not about fish, obviously, but the reason they said that was, you know, they were dolphins. What do dolphins do? They swim around in the ocean and they eat fish. You know, they're quite capable of catching their own fish. They didn't need us to give them fish. So what's that got to do with software? Well, we write tests. The software doesn't need our tests, okay? You can write software and ship it and the customer can be very happy and you can never have a test anywhere in the whole process. But actually the tests help support delivering quality code. Uh, the reason I put this session together was there was a big debate um, last year around whether we should be doing test-driven development or not. Did anyone catch that on the internet? So this is really my response to it. I, I, I'll, I will name names later on, but at the moment I just want to, I want to start with some, some, vague, uh, some vague assertions and move up to some, some, something concrete to say about it. Um, I would like to warn you that I have a terrible tendency to, to read books and then drop pictures of them into my slide deck. So if you're interested, the slides are online, um, and the books I put in here I, I think are really excellent books, and I, personally I wouldn't be the developer and coach that I am today if I hadn't read them. So let's move straight on to the first book. Um, in fact, Letitia already quoted a Jerry Weinberg book. This is a different one. It's not one that seems to be um, very well uh, very widely read. And, you know, uh, not sure you can read it in that, the distance, but the book is called Perfect Software and Other Illusions About Testing. Now, it's important to understand this because there seems to be some uh, misunderstanding throughout the software development community that testing, whether you do it first, in the middle, at the end, somehow you're going to get perfect software. You know, when there's a bug, who do we blame? No. Right? So all that testing is ever going to do is make it less likely that a defect gets through. You're not going to get perfect software. There's a lot of great stuff in this book, but the bit that I want to focus on just now is this quote that I pulled out of it. It's a definition of what testing is, and it's a process of gathering information about software with the intent that the information could be used for some purpose. And that's really important. So if you do the testing and then you ignore the results of the testing, there was no point. You have just wasted effort. So could I see a show of hands? How many people have got a continuous integration server running? How many people have that continuous integration server running red at the moment? One. Only one, two, two honest people. How many people have had the continuous integration server run red for longer than an hour? So my point here is, that if you go back to the original um, description of con continuous integration, the people that first started trying to work with continuous integration, the top priority of the team was keeping the build green. And this is the direct um, extension of this statement. You are running that continuous integration build to make sure that it continuously integrates. And the information that it gives you when it goes red is that, oops, it's not anymore, and therefore you can't check anything else in on top of it. You can't do any other useful work until you've got it going green again, even if that means rolling back the change that made it go red. So that's just one example, but essentially, if you're going to do any form of testing, you need to know why you're doing it. And I think that this forms the basis of a lot of the misunderstanding that gave rise to the sort of heat discussion that we had from last year. So why? Do we write tests? If we assume, let's assume that we're writing them for some reason, why do you write them? One sentence or any sentence. Any offerings. Why do you write tests? To verify, sorry, to verify the behavior of what you do. To verify the behavior? Rachel, you had your hand up. Just, just to confirm that the software does what you think it does. Okay. Makes, it's a it's a it's a makes me think. Makes you think? <laughs> so that is an extremely cynical response, and I hope to deal with that one later. Let's try and break it. Try and break it. Verify my refactors. Okay. Apply the pressure to the design. Apply, so all of those things, and I think all the things that we talked about, like the software not working, the design being <coughs> bad, um, all of them, apart from building by the hour, can be, can be broadly lumped under the, the sort of title heading of managing risks. You've got, whenever you do something with your software, there's a risk that you're going to screw something up. There's a risk you're going to deliver something the customer doesn't want. And so testing is about managing the risk of delivering your software. 
So that, I'm making that assertion. Uh, does anyone strongly disagree with it at this point? Okay. So we're, kind of, we're, trying, we're trying to manage risk. So we're going to have a little bit of participation, a little bit more participation. So we've talked about those things that tests are for, or rather, why do we test? But we'll go specifically into the details of why we want to write tests. So I think um, the first one that I heard was to make sure that it does what we want, you know, that, we haven't, that we're delivering what we're expecting. So we're making sure the code works. Um, did, we already said the second one. Yep, I think someone said, don't want to break it when I refactor. So that's preventing regressions. Um, I've got another couple here that we haven't covered uh, in what has been offered so far. So can think, people think of other, other reasons? Design. Sorry? Design. design. Oh, we did have design. In fact, I've got that comes in a different order, but there you go. <laughs> Document the Thank you. Documenting the code. So I find this really important. A well-written test suite should inform both your colleagues and your peers and also yourself of what the hell you were doing last week. Um, I'm assuming that most of you have had the experience of coming to Piece of Code and uh, thinking, what was this all about? And sometimes thinking, who wrote this rubbish? And then finding out, oops, it was me. <laughs> so documenting the code and driving out a good design. For me, these are four good reasons for writing tests. Um, there are probably others, although I was unable to articulate them. Um, and it's important to understand that we get lots of value out of these these separate areas, and we should unpack and make sure that we aren't just doing it for one reason. So you might write tests, but if they're badly written, you can't maintain them, and that's going to be a pain later on. If they're badly written, they don't add to the documentation, they add to the confusion. If you don't allow them to drive out a good design, you will end up with badly written tests that have huge setups and 37 mocks that need to be injected. So all of these things are important. If you, do, if you just write tests and you don't pay attention to all four of these, you will probably end up in a place where you go, testing doesn't work. Testing does work, but only if you do it well. And that's the same with any practice in the world. So this is another book. It's by other consultants. It's DeMarco and Lister. So I think you also talked about DeMarco somewhere in your talk. So there we go. Again, a different book. This is a, this is a favorite of mine and of a colleague of mine, Liz Keogh. And she likes to quote, um, uh, there's a quote in the introduction here, and it says, um, if there's no risk on your next software project, don't do it. And, that's, uh, and it's an oblique statement that is essentially saying, we are developing things that people want. We're doing things that haven't been done before. We're, trying, we're certainly doing things that we haven't done before. We're using technologies that may be new. We're maybe deploying to platforms that we haven't deployed to. If it's completely risk-free, it's probably a commodity, and you can buy it off the shelf anyway, so why are you doing it? And so once we accept that what we're doing is essentially risky, then that brings the testing into focus. Now we know why, we're, why we have to concentrate on doing testing at some points in our development process. It's because it, what we're doing is inherently risky, and we need to manage that risk somehow. Sometimes I apply what I call the kidney test to, to whether I should write some tests or not. And that generally goes along the lines of, if I release this software and there's a defect in it that causes my customers pain, would I be prepared to lose my kidney? Am I prepared to gamble a kidney on it? <coughs> and that's, a, you know, that's maybe too strong a test for, uh, for, some, for some pieces of software. So obviously, uh, Rachel talked about putting things out there and monitoring it. And that's one way of going. It's equally also true to say that possibly the first time you do it, you're not as worried as the second time. But, <laughs> But, but let's, not, let's, not spend, let's not spend our kidneys so, uh, so profligately. So we need to manage the risk somehow. And we want to write tests, but we need to write those tests in a way that responds to the risk profile of our organization, of the software that we've got. We need to understand that you know, there is cost involved in writing tests and maintaining those tests. So we need to think about what risks are we trying to manage and who is going to benefit from them. And at this point, I'm going to introduce a, um, a consultant's um, tool. It's called a Quadrant. Um, and, of course, by definition, it's got four parts to the quadrant. Um, the, the bottom axis is cost. So how difficult is it to write those tests? You know, how much effort do you have to expend? How much time will be involved? And up the y-axis, we have benefit. So what's the risk of that piece of the system breaking anyway? What benefit will we get from making sure that we've got tests to cover it? 
And down here, if it's expensive to test and there's not a huge risk, it's pointless. And this is an area where people often waste a lot of time. So testing constructors that may be difficult to test, um, doing really funky stuff with selenium to make sure the button is pixel perfect or the color scheme is correct. These are expensive, brittle things, especially when your marketing does department decides to change the layout, and they're not very valuable. I mean, are there any designers in the room? <laughs> so, um, so I would class these as pointless. Let's not do them unless you really have to. Up here, when it's cheap to test and it's highly risky, this is where you really get the biggest benefit from it. This is high value testing. This is catching, hopefully this would catch the negative sign being in the wrong position so you're not buying stocks more expensively than when you sell them. You know, that's the sort of thing that you really want to test there. It's pretty critical. This is a standard testing. You know, it's cheap to test. It's not very risky. This is maybe where TDD really, um, essentially, that's the, the space that uh, TDD and unit testing plays in. And then up here, we've got the difficult ones. We have got uh, tests that are hard to write, hard to maintain, but they're also testing something really chunky. So think about if you're doing insurance work or something like that, and you've got vast databases and you've got lots of inputs. It's really difficult to create that test data. You don't want teams of, um, teams of testers typing it in by hand. You don't want to spend a lot of time, every time you, the product changes, re-entering or modifying lots of different columns. What you need to do is invest in the infrastructure, automate it in some way, create some sort of code structure that will allow you to um, generate that vast amount of test data quickly. Same if you're going to be borrowing production data with customers' names in it and you need to anonymize it. You don't want to go through replacing them all with um, asterisks every time. You, you want to invest in infrastructure. Does this make sense to people? So it's not that all tests are good and no tests are bad. It's you need to think about the context of your organization and the software that you're delivering and work out if it, it makes sense to write that test. So uh, my friend Dan North, who, um, who does a lot of conference speaking, um, has this wonderful, he, he was working with this wonderful way of doing slides where he would just take an index card and you draw on it, take a photo, and then draw some more on it. So it's animation on the cheap. Um, and this is a similar graph to the one that I just showed. And we're talking here about likelihood. So this is the risk of there being a problem in a piece of software. And here in the, the y-axis, it's the impact. It's how serious would it be if that went wrong? And the question is, is it just as important to test this component as it is to test that component? No, thank you. Um, and that's the, that's the thing to understand. There are some things that are really risky and some things where it's not so important to do that testing. Now, he goes one step further and he says, well, how do you know how much testing you've done? So, does anyone in this room do anything to check on how good their testing is? What do you do? Coverage. Code coverage? Uh, mutation testing. Mutation testing. Any others? So, that, that covers both the things I'm going to say next. So, this is the question about, is 80% coverage good enough up here? Is it too much down here? And the, the answer is probably it's not enough up here, and probably it's too much down there. It needs to be said here about code coverage, because a lot of people put their hand up about checking on the quality of their tests. How many of you were actually thinking about code coverage when you put your hand up? Yeah, most. So code coverage is an important metric that shows you which parts of your code have definitely not been tested. But actually, that is all it tells you. Right? You can get 100% coverage without doing a single assert. So all that will tell you is that the code doesn't throw random exceptions. So code coverage, while it does give you some information, it doesn't give you very good information. Now, Jason talked about mutation testing. And mutation testing uh, is another tool that's been around for Actually, it's been around for 30 or 40 years in academia. And the idea behind mutation testing is you take your software and then you modify a single expression in that, as in you inject a default, and then you run, and that creates a mutant, and then you run all of your unit tests, and if you don't get a failure, then the mutant has survived. And in a very non-politically correct way, 
Our aim is to kill all mutants. <laughs> this is a really good tool. Uh, Java's got a wonderful tool set. Ruby has got one. Um, unfortunately, .NET, if you work in it, have a number, and they're all pretty rubbish. Um, so, uh, another book, and an, another, another famous exponent of the, of the craft. This is a book by Kent Beck. It's called TDD by Example, and it probably started the whole ball rolling. Um, and the quote that I've got here doesn't come from this book. It comes from an exchange that Kent had on Stack Overflow a few years ago. And I think it's, it just reiterates what the point I'm trying to make. So he's, he's, he's explicitly stating that he does not get paid for writing tests. So our job is not to write tests. Our job is to deliver code that fulfills some requirement of our customers. But... Even having said that, we want to be confident that the code that we deliver actually works. And uh, Kent actually writes a lot of tests, and so he suspects that the level of confidence that he wants before he release, releases software is higher than the industry average. And you need to understand where you sit in that industry scale. Do you need to be really confident? Is it going to be an airliner crashing? Is it going to be a medical device causing people to die? Or is it possibly someone's booking to have their pet manicured is going to be screwed up. And these are very potentially different, um, different scenarios. Have people seen this diagram before? Has anyone not seen it? OK. So this is, this is the um, testing pyramid, so-called by Mike Cohn. Um, and as everyone can see, it's a triangle. So already it wasn't tested properly. Um, and the bottom axis, although it's not labelled here, the bottom axis is how many tests do we have in this area? So how much investment have we placed into testing? And the, the y-axis is how much of the system does each test exercise? So down here at the bottom, um, in the area that people would sometimes call unit tests, we've got small tests that, that they verify the behaviour of a single component. And as you go up through... Um, the heights of the pyramid, you're testing more of the application stack. So by the time you get to the, the top of the stack, um, you have end-to-end -end system tests that test the whole of the system. So it'll be, they, they'll be system tests. And in the middle, you have integration tests. And just, lest we forget that automated tests are almost never enough, there's some exploratory testing around the top. So maybe we'll talk to Rachel about this later, about how they do exploratory testing or whether they really let their customers do it. Very quickly, do you yeah. automate exploratory testing? OK, well then, th this is, if only we had an open space later on, we could talk about that. But, uh, and just to make this concrete, I'd like to, I'd like to sort of um, connect it back to a, a different domain, the, the automotive industry. So components in isolation, we're talking about things that are discrete. They might not be simple, or, or rather they may not be a single thing. So a lot of people get confused between the idea of component and unit. And then the trouble with a unit is it's very difficult to describe, define what a unit is. But these are all analogous to units. They are things with an external interface. They are completely self-dependent. You know, they're they're self-contained. And so you can test them in isolation. One, <coughs> one unit, you, somebody else may decompose that unit into separate units and test each bit independently. But for our purposes, these are the units within a car. You can buy them off the shelf. You then have subsystems of interacting components. So we're talking about the engine, the cooling system, the steering rack. There's lots of bits going on. Here we make right, different tests. We're not testing the, the, um, the bearings in the steering wheel are bearings, that work as bearings. What we're testing is that the steering rack and the wheel, um, the hubs, they're all connected in the correct way. So here we're testing the protocols and the interactions between the components. And then finally, when we get to the top, we want to make sure that when we put it, uh, drive it at 30 miles an hour, wheels don't start falling off. We're not trying to test all of the different interactions. This is almost like a smoke test. This is tr do going through some happy paths and a few, an exception, a few exceptional cases. And then no one would want a car that would only be testing on a rolling road, so we take it out. We drive it at walls with test dummies. We put it on a track and see whether it falls over. Um, like the Mercedes did when it was going around uh, on the test track in Germany. So, so this is the analogy of what testing we do at each level. And just to ram it home, I'm going to do it again, but in different language. The component works as expected. They interact correctly. It hangs together. This is your smoke test. And then, ooh, didn't think about that. 
We didn't write a test. It's important when we're writing tests um, to understand about how, we, how to keep them maintainable. And over, uh, over the past four or five years that I've been working with teams trying to improve their testing skills, I've identified these six um, properties of tests that I think need to be considered when you write a test. Um, now, I've got, uh, I've, actually, I've got a three-day training course that goes into this. So I'm not going to cover it in full depth here, clearly. But I hope you, I hope you can see what those, those, those separate properties are. So if it's not understandable, you'll not be able to maintain it. It won't act as documentation. If it's not maintainable, then when somebody adds a new, compo a new parameter to an interface or you go for a plug-in architecture over a configuration file, you'll, you'll find all your tests break. This one is this one's important, and this is one that I see. This is an anti-pattern I see um, in many, many places. The, oh, the test, the, the CI build is red, but when I bring the test down to the desktop, it works. Or the CI test is red, but it sometimes does that. And next time, it will be green. So this is not good. This undermines entirely your confidence in your test suite. And if you're not confident in your test suite, then you don't react to it as soon as it goes red. Um, necessary, that might seem tautological. Well, of course they need to be necessary. But you'd be surprised how many test suites have got um, hundreds of things that test exactly the same thing. I have, um, I have an example that I'm, I, I won't show just now that I, I plundered off of GitHub. And it's a, it's a .NET test for converting Roman numerals into, um, uh, into decimal numerals. And it's, if, if it wasn't so sad, it would be funny. Because... They've used, they've, they've used a test fixture so they can run the same test with as many different values as you like. And you expand the region, and it's, there's, it's got about 2,000 test cases. Right? They're, they're, and it's covering the range between 0 and 3,999. So you have to ask yourself, either do every bloody one, or just pick the important ones. So the important thing here is don't overdo it. More tests is not better tests. You need to ha use the right tests. And it's equally true that a test that's right now may not be necessary tomorrow. So uh, if, you, if you do read Kent Beck's book, he'll, you'll see in there he talks about triangulation. And I'm not going to go into the details of it, but it essentially means you write two tests that are very similar to force you to write an implementation. But once you've written that implementation, you don't need the, both the tests. Only one of those tests is likely to survive. And my, my last two properties are in brackets because these apply very much to tests low down in the pyramid and less to tests higher up in the pyramid. So granular is you should only test a single behavior. Because if the fit test fails, then you want to know what it was that broke. And if the test tests half a dozen different behaviors, you either have to go into the code to find out where it broke, or you have to do some other work to identify the problem. Equally, the problem with this is that if, you have, if a test tests half a dozen different behaviors and it's the second behavior that breaks, you still don't know if behaviors three, four, five, and six are broken. So in small components, try and make sure that a test only exercises a single behavior. And finally, fast, absolutely essential for unit tests. A unit test suite should run on your desktop in you know, sub 10 seconds, hopefully sub a second. You know, any set of unit tests that takes a minute to run, you're not going to run every time you change the code, which makes it really hard to do refactoring. This is not such a problem when you're at the top doing end-to-end -to -end tests. That's going to take time. That's something that typically happens downstream somewhere else in your continuous integration build pipeline. And if it takes an hour, that's acceptable. If it takes a week, you've maybe got an issue. So, so those are the ones that I go with. Um, Roy Osharov has got has got his own variety of this, and he's got, he's got either three or nine, depending on which book he, you, of his you read. Um, but we, we cover the same ground. We're looking to make sure that the tests serve their purpose. So, a thought experiment. Think of your tests. If I came into your office, like the magic pixie, and I said, you can either keep all of your production code or all of your tests, which would you choose? <laughs> Production code. Who, who would keep the production code? 
Yes, yeah, exactly. Who would keep the tests? So, so these are people who are confident in their test suite. Now, the rationale behind this, because it might sound crazy, the rationale behind it is that if you delete your tests, you have got no um, reliable specification of what your system does. And without a reliable specification of what your system does, how can you refactor? Because refactoring means changing the structure of the code without modifying the externally observable behavior. But if you've got no specification of what that externally observable behavior is, how are you going to know? On the other hand, if you delete your production code and you've got a good suite of tests, then you should be able to enable the tests one by one and build a new and probably better implementation of your production code being guided by the specification that you wrote earlier. Now, clearly, uh, we don't want either of these things to happen, and I'm sure you'll have wonderful um, source control systems that, that keep it the more safe. But it's worth thinking about it as a, you know, as a, a, as a thought exercise, and B, when you go back to work and think about, do I really want to make this test look a bit better? And the answer typically is you should treat your production, your, your tests, at least as well as your production code, because they are the insurance, they are the specification, and they are the documentation. Um, the book, by the way, is by Uncle Bob, who um, I'm, I'm assuming that most of you at least heard of uh, Uncle Bob. He's written a lot of great books. So, when do you write your tests? How many people never write tests? One, okay. Speak to me afterwards. <laughs> How many people write their tests after they finish writing the code? Some, sometimes, good. How many while you're writing the code? And how many before writing the code? So there we go. There, there's a sort of gradation on the way up. But the truth is, okay, nobody writes all of their tests before they write the code. Most people do some mixture. This is a, a diagram from um, another great book, which I think I plug on the next slide. And this is your, your traditional test-driven development cycle here in the middle. H how many people are not familiar with test-driven development? One, OK. Well, briefly then, just for yourself, um, in TDD, the idea is you try and think about what the next piece of functionality is you want to implement in your code. And then you write a test to express that desire, and the test should fail. That's the red. And then you do something really simple to make it pass, which gets you to green. And you probably do something as simple as possible. So this is often called shameless green, because you can do anything the hell you like to get it to pass. And then you refactor mercilessly until the code is as good as you want it to be. And each time you do a refactor, you run the test again, it should still be at green. And then you go back, and you write another fa failing test. Uh, and what uh, Nat's done here is he said, well, actually, we can extend this out to the business domain and include our acceptance tests. We can ex include our customers and specify <coughs> here what it is you know, at a larger level we want to achieve. What is, this, what is the next micro feature, bit of micro capability that we want to deliver to our customers? And then we go into a development cycle until we get that um, acceptance test to pass. So we, for each trip around the outer loop, you may do tens or hundreds of trips around the inner loop. And this is described in many books, but it's described very well in this one. So this is um, a book called Growing Object Oriented Software Guided by Tests. Um, uh, so it's uh, written in London in the, maybe 15 years ago, maybe not that long. And the examples in it are in Java. But I, even if you're not a Java user, I would strongly urge you to read this book. It's not about Java. And it has an awful lot of really good information in it. And possibly the, the biggest learning that comes out of it is to listen to your tests. So if you find it's difficult to write that test, think about your architecture. Your tests are a customer of the code, a client of the code. If you are finding it difficult to write a test, it's probably going to be hard for the system that wants to utilize your code to utilize it. If you're finding it difficult to set up a, the, the context to run your test in, it's probably because you have a, hidden dependencies that would make it hard for you to modify the code based on environments. So it's a really important thing. If the tests are hard to write, it's probably because you could, you could architect your software in a simpler way. So listen to your tests is, is my favorite, um, is my favorite uh, 
nugget that comes out of that book. Now, these are the gentlemen that have been participating in the, the discussion about whether TDD is a good thing or a bad thing over, um, over the past year or two. Um, you may recognize some of them. It all started with this gentleman here, who is, is um, uh, he's called DHH. He's not called DHH. He, he's universally known as DHH. David Heinemeyer Hansen, he's the creator of uh, Rails, uh, the Ruby framework. And he did, a, he did a keynote where he said, um, TDD damaged the structure of your code and sparked off a little bit of a firestorm. And we asked the question here, should he TDD or not? And a lot of people chipped in, you know, Martin Fowler, J.B. Rainsberg, Kemp Beck, they all, they all cruised in, and there was a lot of discussion, all of which was pretty pointless, because it's not the right question. A TDD is one way of approaching software development. When, when do I, am I at three o'clock? Is that? When, when do I run till? Uh, so you're, yeah, you're on to say you got your five minutes. Okay. <laughs> so, yes, right. Can you imagine why? No, I can't possibly imagine why, Paul. So, um, so this is not the right question. Because the point is, these are wonderful people. They're really good at what they do. They are world-class experts. And they are giving advice to people who haven't asked for that advice. They don't know who you are. They don't know how good you are at this or that. They don't know the context of your organization. Their advice is contextual, but they haven't expressed the context in which it applies, and you, as a person reading that advice, don't know whether it applies to you. Um, so this is the, uh, the Shuhari uh, model of, well, it's not the model of skills acquisition, but it's one way of looking at it, and it comes out of the martial arts. Does anyone, did anyone see the original Karate Kid? Yeah. yeah. So, you know, the wax on, wax off. Before you can learn Karate, you've got to learn how to polish a car. Right, so this is down in the shoe level. This is you follow the rule, you get told what to do, and by doing it, you begin to get in tune with what you're, what's, what you're ha what's happening. And then, as you've got to get, get a bit better, you experiment by breaking the rule um, yourself, consciously. And when you become an expert, you are the rule. You know, you just do things, and you probably find it hard to explain why you do it that way. And this is the problem that our ex experts from the previous slide um, have fallen foul of. Because Bob Martin resolutely talks to this level of developer. He says, this is what you should do. You must do it like this. If you don't, you are a bad person. Um, and up here, we've got DHH, who is an extremely, you know, he's, well, actually, I don't know how good a developer he is. What can I say? But I'm assuming he's an expert developer. And he's found that in his particular environment, it works better to do end-to-end um, -end system tests and no TDD, write them afterwards just to make sure it works. And in between, there, you know, there are many people in between. So you need to understand the context. But how do you know where you are on this level? And the answer is you probably don't. There's, there's another, um, uh, yes, there's a, the Dunning-Kruger effect, which is that people who think, uh, people who aren't very expert at something often rate themselves as really good at something. And people who are absolute experts often rate themselves really low. And so we have an issue, even if they said this is advice for experts or this is advice for beginners, the beginners would ignore the beginner's advice and the experts probably would go down and you look at somebody else's. So we have a real problem. So how do we solve that problem? And uh, for me, the answer is you need to practice. Um, so for developers, this is a wonderful tool that um, is freely available on the internet, uh, written by a co colleague of mine called John Jagger, where you can do code dojos in your, um, in your workplace or at home on a number of different platforms. I think it's got 18 languages built into it at the moment. I'm going to skip over that. Uh, but there's a lot of people who object to, um, to uh, this approach to TDD. So um, I'm go I wish John Skeet was here because I can say, I did some research. Uh, so um, a few years ago, I put out a, a web form on the internet and I said, why, um, why, do, why don't you do TDD? Or if you do, do TDD, how hard was it to adopt it? But if you don't, why don't you? What are the objections? And uh, so the, the first little bit of learning is here, never ever put a free form text box <coughs> on a widely available questionnaire, because that just is a, a, yeah, the final straw. But anyway, having been through, <laughs> having been through that free form text box of three or 400, um, you know, small sample size, three or 400 submissions, they fell into roughly five areas. We haven't been taught how to do it. We haven't got the time to do it. I'm not convinced of the benefits of doing it. Our project um, is not suitable for TDD, and our culture doesn't think it's a great idea of testing. You know, we're all 
coding rock stars, so why would we do testing? Um, and each of those I've got, I, uh, you, if, you, if you're interested, if you look for TDD objections, you'll, you'll find the slide deck on the web um, where, I, where I say where I think that all of these can be addressed quite, quite readily. Um, the most important one is the benefits. There has been um, empirical research done um, in places like so Microsoft and IBM where they've seen a return on investment of between 10 and 90% from doing the TDD. So uh, there's very little evidence that TDD slows you down in the long run. Um, another book plug, Michael Feathers talked about the difference between legacy code and uh, non-legacy code. And normally, we would think that legacy code, the difference is that legacy code was written a long time ago. It's something that somebody else wrote. Um, it's old. Whereas Michael, who wrote this truly amazing book, um, says it's nothing to do with how long ago it was written or who wrote it. It's to do with how many tests there are. If it's not well tested, it's legacy code. Because it's hard to work with. So, the benefits of good tests. They make sure that the code works. They make sure that the code still works. So this is important, you know, because a developer will ship a bit of code and say, yeah, I tried it on my desktop. And the tester will do a manual test. Yeah, it's okay. But that means that the next time you release it, you've got to do all that manual stuff again. You need to make that automated. It gives you living documentation. And this is, I haven't used this word particularly here, but it's to do with the fact that tests are better than other documentation. So has anyone ever seen a comment in the code that no longer applies to the code underneath it? <laughs> sure, of course you have, yeah. This is living documentation because your tests will break if they no longer reflect what the system does. And at that point, you get the choice. Have I introduced a bug? I'll fix it. Or has the system specification changed? You fix the documentation, i.e. the test. And finally, you get design feedback. So, advice may not apply to your context. When reading things on the internet, reading books, always, can, always assume that it may not be true for you and you need to try it yourself. You have to make choices based on actual experience. So, certainly don't go in, I read somewhere that TDD is rubbish, I'm not going to try it. Equally, whenever you pick up a new skill, you've got to try it for quite a while before you're in a position to make a qualified decision. But absolutely fundamentally, tests are about making your life easier. They're about making sure the code does what the customer wants and that you can communicate your intent, intent to, to yourself and other people. If tests make your life harder, something is going wrong. And you need to take a step back and ask yourself, what is it that's going wrong? So. Start with Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, we'll end with it. There's a lot of stuff in and around the testing area. You know, it's not trivial. The, the whole um, TDD and unit testing approach is quite alien to many uh, development cultures. So don't panic. Use CyberDojo or work with your colleagues to try and um, improve. Uh, that's me. You can contact me by email. You can tweet at me. Um, I blog occasionally. For those of you who want to take it one step further and thinking about doing behavior-driven development, which is, um, you remember, the outer loop of the NAT price cycle, um, this is my, my book that got published two weeks ago. And just for you, we have a 25% off uh, voucher for the next month, which is nordevcon underscore 25. Um, there's a lot of Java code in this book, but it's also got a couple of sections in it that are just there um, for, well, not just that, but are readable by your manager um, and your business analyst. Thank you very much.